see if I can describe to you what I think worries and anxieties often feel like and you see if you can relate to these metaphors. I think sometimes it can feel like a cartoon. Maybe you've seen a cartoon at some point where there's a superhero and at some point he is assailed by a bunch of bad guys. It's usually the lower level bad guys and one at a time they come upon the superhero and they form a kind of pile up and they just pile up upon him until he shakes them off. Now I'm not likening us to superheroes but I think that worries and fears can sometimes feel like that, a kind of bombardment whereby we are assailed by these opposing forces that are essentially worries and fears. Or perhaps it's like this to you sometimes. Like there's a fly of worry or fear that just keeps buzzing around your head and then you swat it. And then it's laying on the floor and you think it's dead. And then all of a sudden it arises and what does it do? It begins to buzz around your head again. And the sequence goes on over and over again. And you find yourself, keep, you, you, you keep having to swat the same fly of fear over and over again. And you find that it doesn't stay dead. It just keeps coming back. Or perhaps it feels like something like this. That you go to the Lord. You know that in the Psalter, you're told to cast your burden upon the Lord, for He will sustain you. And you know that in First Peter, you're told to cast your cares upon Him, because He cares for you. And what you find experientially sometimes, is you go before the Lord, and you cast your cares upon Him. And they're like a big, heavy knapsack that's upon your back and shoulders. And you lay it down at the feet of the Lord. And what you sometimes experientially find is that like a claymation cartoon, those burdens of yours, all of a sudden they sprout feet. And they make their way back to you and they jump back upon your shoulders and you find yourself carrying them once again. Now there are times in our lives where we have very legitimate concerns. Concerns that arise from things that are serious. Uh, sometimes we have things that aren't, shouldn't be a concern, like you have a body ache and then all of a sudden you're imagining what your funeral is going to be like. And you're saying, what are they going to say during my eulogy? And it's just one of many kinds of body aches that could be nothing serious. And we jump to conclusions. We do that sort of thing. But then there are times when our concerns and our fears are driven by a, a situation that's very serious and very concerning. And what do we do in that moment? When all of a sudden we do have a legitimately concerning situation right before us. And then we're assailed by fears. And in our minds we kind of hear the logic and rationale of our flesh saying, you have every reason to be afraid. You have every reason to be fearful of this situation. Your life may end. Your health may deteriorate. Things may break down. Your family may be in trouble. And all of these things start assailing your mind. What do you do? Do all of a sudden you make peace with that fly of fear that keeps buzzing around your head and say, this is just the way it's going to be. So I'll let the fly stay there. You just let the pile up continue and you just give up trying to throw those fears off? Do you stop casting your cares because you find that they often make themselves present again on your shoulders and on your back? And the answer to every one of those questions is a resounding no. And if you were to say, well, what do we do when we feel like that? When we feel like we can't shake the worry or can't shake the fear? I think part of what we do is laid out for us here in this psalm. We do, by the grace of God, what we see David do here in Psalm 3. We follow the Spirit-inspired example of David. And doubtless, one of the reasons why this is recorded in Holy Scripture is not to just to be, say, a memorial to an event, to use language from Tremper Longman, but that it might be a model. But then... As we behold David's model of prayer, if you will, for a situation when there's fears and worries that arise from a legitimately serious situation, we'll talk more about that in a moment, as we walk through this text, we're not only beholding a model for what we should do when we find ourselves in situations that are very worrisome, some of which can arise and flare up in a moment, but we're going to see via David's ascriptions to God and his descriptions of God, we're going to find out more about who our God is and why he is so worthy of trust. We'll see that when we get there, but first, I want us to consider a little bit of the context leading up to this. As we make our way out of the entrance hall of the Psalter, that's proverbially speaking, Psalm 1 and 2, right? We studied Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, so we're leaving, as it were, the entrance hall of the Psalter, and now we come to Psalm 3, which is in many ways a psalm of firsts. It's the first psalm in which we have the author explicitly identified within the Psalter. It's the first psalm that has a superscript tied to it. It's the first psalm in which we see the word Selah. It's the first psalm that is the kind of psalm that we tend to think of when we think of the psalms. 
Because in this psalm, we see an enumeration of problems by the psalmist. We see cries and petitions being lifted up to God. And we see praise being offered to God by virtue of and by way of declarations of trust. And we'll get there. But first, we'll give attention to the preface that comes via the superscript. The superscript for this psalm is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Now the word psalm is the Hebrew word mizmor. It basically speaks to a musical composition. So remember, these psalms that were written were meant to be sung among the congregation of Israel. So this is a psalm. This is a musical composition. That's how it was originally written and intended. David is clearly identified as the psalm's author, as is the case with the majority of the psalms in Book 1 of the Psalter. That's Psalms 1 through 41. And the context of the psalm is, when he fled from Absalom his son. Now just taking that superscript right there at face value, you have to love how David, in the midst of his flight from his son Absalom, nonetheless composed a psalm unto the Lord. This wasn't his first time doing that kind of thing, by the way. You could look at other psalms. You could look at uh, psalms earlier in the Psalter when he was on the run from Saul. We see some occasions when he wrote psalms on that occasion. And you could just imagine David kind of formulating this while on the run or maybe in a moment of quiet. I don't know how exactly it came about, but I think there's some instruction there for us. David is on the run for his life. His own son has led a rebellion against him. And in the midst of that, nonetheless, he's composing this psalm unto the Lord. I think that's instructive. Now, as a brief and abbreviated refresher, I want to give you a little bit of a, a review of how David got to this situation. If you wanted to read the whole story, and when I say that, I mean what preceded it and what proceeded after it, you would basically read from 2 Samuel 13 through 2 Samuel 18. You could see some of David's grieving also in 2 Samuel 19. But basically, the rundown goes like this. When Absalom, David's son, had returned from exile, he began to enact a plan to overthrow his father, David. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, we see what he began to do. He would have horses and chariots and 50 men go before him. We see that in verse 1. And the idea was that Absalom would make himself look like a political figure, like a king. It was a very shrewd move. He figured that the people would be more apt to receive him as a king if he looked the part. And then when you look at verses 2 through 4 of 2 Samuel 15, you could see that this man labored intensely. We're told that he would arise early and he would stand beside the way to the gate so that whenever anyone came and had a lawsuit that they were going to bring to the king, he would be standing there. He would call out to them. We see that in verse 2. He would hear their case. We see that in verse 3. He would tell them that no deputy of the king was available for them. See that in the second half of verse 3. And then in verse 4, he told them that if he were a judge in the land, the people would receive justice. Now remember, in those days, the king was not only the head of the army or the government, but the king functioned, if you will, as the highest judge in the land. You could look at 1 Kings chapter 3, and you see Solomon settling a dispute for the two women that came to him. Absalom then, he opportunistically stood beside the gate, and he endeared himself over and over again to people who were troubled, he would sympathetically hear their cases and he strategically would leave the troubled person more troubled than they were before they came to him. And this was successful. He promoted the discontentment that prepared the way for the overthrow of David's kingship. As people came to him, they would bow down and he would take them by the hand, lift them up and kiss them. And then we see in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 6 that as the people of Israel came to the king for judgment and were intercepted by Absalom, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So the seeds for a successful revolution had been planted during that time. And now once again, this all happened under David's nose. Like he is unaware that this is happening and then all of a sudden you can imagine the shock that went through David's mind when he gets word that the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And all of a sudden this is happening in a moment and all of a sudden the revolutionaries are the people that David had been serving. They were his own constituents. 
People who were probably saying, Greetings, King David, how are you? Not too long before, were now seeking to murder him. And at the head of those who were against him was his own son, Absalom. That's the backdrop with which we enter into this psalm. So we begin in Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2, where we read, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. Now again, consider how great a rebellion happened right under David's nose. This wasn't like a, a little group of people launching terrorist attacks, terrorist type attacks against the kingdom. They weren't issuing guerrilla warfare like strategies. This was a full out revolution that happened right under David's nose. 2 Samuel 15, 13, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. That's what David was told. This was a revolution where the citizenry that, led, that was led by David comprised the revolutionaries. So when David says, and you look at verse 1, Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. You get an idea of who the many were. It was a large portion of the population of Israel. That's who the many comprised. Now after dressing the Lord by His covenant name, Yahweh, that's the identification here, Yahweh, David used the interrogative pronoun how. But he used it in an exclamatory way. So you get this kind of feel when you look at verse 1. Lord, how? There's an exclamatory bent to this. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. The word for increased could be rendered as multiplied. And you can imagine as this defection happened and people were in a moment trying to have to choose what side they were going to be on that many people defected from David to Absalom so that David at least for a time beheld a multiplication process if you will. Where the numbers against him were increasing. Oh, How they have increased who trouble me. And then he goes on and he says many are they who rise up against me. He's going to say that again in verse 2. He's going to use the word many. So you see the word many in verse 1. You see the word many in verse 2. It gives you an idea that there were many people against him. What's general here gets very specific in verse 6. We find out that it's tens of thousands of people that have risen up against David. And let us not forget, this wasn't a collection of you know, nameless and faceless people. In many cases, these were people that David knew or trusted or served alongside. Ahithophel is among the conspirators, someone told David. And it wasn't just what they did, it was what they said. Look at verse 2. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now the language here is very strong. Very literally, when David said, many are those who say of me, in the Hebrew the words of me could literally be translated as of my soul or to my soul. They're essentially striking at the core of David's being and they're assailing him with what was the most bitter of railings. There's no help for him in God. Now the line of thought among some people might be, might be represented by a man by the name of Shimei. Shimei is how that name is usually pronounced in English. He's the man who was from Bahurim, who met David during his exile at Bahurim, and he began to curse David, he began to kick dirt upon David, he began to throw stones at David, he called David a bloodthirsty man, and he told him that God was bringing upon him all the blood of the household of Saul. Perhaps there were others, maybe those close to David, some, who knew of David's transgression with Bathsheba and against Uriah. And perhaps many came to the conclusion, this is it. God is ripping away the kingdom from David, even as he ripped away the kingdom from Saul. And maybe there were plenty of people who didn't know about that particular transgression, but nonetheless could conclude nothing else. This must be what's happening. How does this happen here that David's own son rises up against him and steals the kingdom? God must be against David. There's no help for him in God. Could have been any number of things that went through people's minds. And you have to love what David did. What did David do against the backdrop of these assertions? He cries out to the God who people were saying will provide no help for him. That's what he does. 
It's as though he hears the, the cries of the people against him saying, there's no help for him in God. And you know what David says? David says, I'm going to God for help. And I think that in itself is so instructive. Now there's a place, especially in our precious and near interpersonal relationships that we enjoy in the body of Christ, there's a place for saying to a brother, right? Joe, many are they who have risen up against me. Or if you think about David and his circumstances, you can imagine him going to Bathsheba. Bathsheba, many are they who have risen up against me. There's a place for that. But preferably, what we would do before we do any of that is that we would do what David did. Lord, Yahweh, many are they who rise up against me. This isn't Psalm 54, first half of verse 4, where we're told there in the Psalter, Behold, Yahweh, or the Lord, is my helper. But the idea is connoted here nonetheless. David knew that he was bringing his help, looking for help from his God. Not a God who could care less, <laughs> but a God who was his help. I do also want to call to our attention a parallel here between David and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You consider our Lord and Savior as He writhed in pain upon the cross and in the midst of His immeasurable display of love as He bore the wrath of God on our behalf, He was mocked as people walked by and blasphemed and mocked Him. And part of what they said was, He trusted in God let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Matthew 27, verse 43. So part of the mocking was essentially this. There's no help for him in God. Let's see if there's any real help for him in God. He'll come down from the cross. So even as David in this moment was mocked and jeered outside of the city of Jerusalem, so the Lord Jesus Christ was mocked and jeered outside of the city gate as he suffered the wrath of God on behalf of sinners like us. And I just want to encourage you, Christian, if you are in Christ, it's because of what Jesus Christ has done for you that you can never say, there is no help for me in God. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done for you that you could always know that there is always help for you in God. To expound upon that a little bit further, remember how many times before Jesus would suffer on the night he was betrayed and then subsequently would suffer, remember how many times he spoke about the Holy Spirit coming and he identified the Holy Spirit as being the helper. We see that repeatedly in John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16, 7. The Christian at any moment can always approach the throne of grace to receive what? Mercy and grace to help in the time of need. In that same precious passage where we are told that the Lord Jesus will never leave us or forsake us in Hebrews 13, we are also told that we can boldly say, and you can say this at any moment, the Lord is my helper. Hebrews 13, 6. If you are a Christian, you can never say, there is no help for me in God. And if anyone were ever say that about you, you know it's not true because of what Christ has done. Now a brief word about the word Selah. So we come to the end of verse 2 and then we see the word Selah. We'll see it a couple other times in this psalm. What does that word mean? Well, there's much uh, discussion about it. There's no particular consensus about it. It seems to have been a piece of musical instruction that would have been a musical instruction calling for a kind of interlude, a musical interlude, or maybe a pause maybe providing people with an opportunity for, if you will, stop and think about it moments during this musical pause or interlude. So that may be what's going on when we read the word Selah. And in light of that, we could be reminded every time we see it to make sure that we think upon what we're reading. That we don't just read, but we spend some time during and after thinking about the Word of God, even as we've read it. Well, many thought that David had no help in God, but David knew that wasn't true, and that brings us to verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. So here you see the contrast between what David's opponents and enemies said about his relationship with God and what David knew was true 
You, O Lord. Yeah, actually, you have the conjunction here and a second person pronoun. I won't go into the details, but it's kind of a, a strong emphatic here. But you, despite what they're saying, they're saying I have no help in you. They're saying that. But I know, but you, O Yahweh, you are, and he goes on and says, a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. And before we break down those verses, I want us just to observe what David is doing. He is lifting up his eyes from the many. The many who are speaking threatening words. The many, as we're going to see in verse 6, have set themselves round about him. He's lifting his eyes up from the many, and he's lifting his eyes up to the one who is his help. And that is instructive. We are often like the children of Israel, and we can spend too much time looking at and magnifying our problems, even as the children of Israel looked at the giants that were in the land. You could see Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28. And that's what we so often do. We gaze upon our problems way too much and for way too long. David here goes from declaring his trouble to affirming the God who was with him, to use language from James Montgomery Boyce. You think about his enemies. They have many swords, words and weapons alike, but David had a greater shield. And that's where he begins. He says, But you, O Yahweh, are a shield for me. This is an identification that God himself used when speaking with Abram, soon to be known as Abraham. Right? Abram had rescued his nephew Lot from the confederation of kings. And we see that in Genesis 14. Then in Genesis 15, the implication appears to be that Abram was afraid of some retaliation from these kings. And Yahweh speaks to him and says that he was Abram's shield. I am your shield. David's using that kind of language here. And Yahweh was not simply like an arm shield or a body shield. He was like a shield round about David. Now, even if 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31 wasn't in the Bible, which says that God is a shield to all who trust in Him, for you who are in Christ, you would know that you can personalize what David is saying here for yourself. Because remember, this psalm was not just David's psalm. It was meant for the people of God. Under the Old Covenant, the people of God would sing it. And under the New Covenant, we too can join in singing this psalm. Remember, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is God-breathed and is profitable. So you can come alongside of this psalm and you could say to your God, you, Yahweh, are a shield for me. Notice how also he identified God. He said, you are a shield for me. And he also goes on and he says, my glory. I think this is particularly inspiring to hear David say that in the midst of his circumstances, possibly lying out in an open field at this moment when he's first thinking of these words and praying these words, having left the glories of his throne, David tells the Lord that he is his glory. He left his riches he wept and he walked with bare feet and his head uncovered. He was likely wearied, as we see that he was in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. People probably questioned his wisdom, like, seriously? A whole rebellion just formed under your nose and you don't even know about it? But he could say in the midst of all that, the Lord was his glory. I think that is so incredibly instructive. His glory wasn't in, to use language from one commentator, past accomplishment or present potential. His glory was in God. More about the application of that in a little while, because I think that's very instructive for us. Your glorying should not be found in things that are fleeting, but in the God who is faithful. That's how God would have it. He doesn't want you glorying and saying, my glory is in my identity as a skillful practitioner of whatever I practice. My glory is in my strength. I'm strong. My glory is in my beauty. My glory is in my success. My glory is in my riches. He does not want you saying that. I can tell you very clearly he does not want you saying that. Among many reasons, I could say in light of Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, the Lord said very clearly through the prophet Jeremiah that the wise man should not glory in his wisdom and that the mighty man should not glory in his strength that the rich man should not glory in his riches. But he goes on and he says this, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. 
that he understands and knows me. And then he elaborates upon who he is. That I am Yahweh, he says. Exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight. David could be removed from all that fallen man might look at as glorious. And yet he could say that he still had his glory because the Lord was his glory. And he also identifies the Lord here as the one who lifts up his head. So the imagery here is pretty easy to see. Uh, a hanging head connotes discouragement. It can connote despondency. It can connote shame. And all those implications, I think, are at play here. And the natural tendency for us in times of great adversity is at some point for our heads to hang low. For our heads to hang low. And that may take different forms. You might be holding your head in your hands as you just cry and you just say, I can't believe this happened or I can't believe the situation I'm in. Or it could be from persecution and your head hangs low because you just got embarrassed somewhere because you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it's very important for all of us to remember that God is the lifter of His people's heads. He's the one who brings His people from a state of being downcast to being uplifted. He's the lifter of His people's heads. He brings His people from being in a state of sinking to a place of buoyancy. That's who He is. Ultimately, ultimately, He brings all of His people from a place of shame to honor. Now think about this. This is just one verse. Psalm 3, verse 3. And it tells you a lot about God. <laughs> you in this moment, you could look at this and you could say, I see who God is a little bit more clearly in light of this. He is the protector. He is the glory. And he is the head lifter of his people. That's who God is. And then you could personalize it. Again, this is not just David's psalm. This is meant to be your psalm. You could say, but you, O oh Yahweh, are a shield for me. You are my protector. You have protected me from things I don't even know about, yet alone the things you've protected me from that I do know about. You have protected me and shielded me from your own very wrath by opening your eyes, opening my eyes, to the gospel of your Son. You, O oh Yahweh, are a shield for me. You could say to the Lord, you are my glory. You could pray, Lord, help me not to find my glory in my identity or my education in anything that's disconnected apart from you, my, my riches, my success, whatever it might be. Let me find my glorying in you. You are my glory. I glory in the fact that I know you. I glory in the fact that my identity is as a son or daughter of the living God, that I have union with Christ. I glory in that. You can know that God is the lifter of your head. You can know that though your head may hang low, it will not hang low forever. That God brings His people from a state of despondency to a place of joy. And He will bring, in the final analysis, all of His people from a place of shame to a place of honor. My head cannot hang low forever. That brings us to verse 4 where David writes, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and He heard me from His holy hill, Selah. It's hard to overstate this simple truth that David found it his habit, his practice to go to the Lord and cry out to God in prayer, especially in times of affliction and trials. He says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. And I think that's instructive. David knew that God knew his heart. David knew that before a word was on his tongue, God knew it altogether already. That's very clear later on in the Psalter. David knew that. But nonetheless, he says, I cried out to God with my voice. Sometimes, limiting personal prayer to intercessions that only take place in our minds can, I think, help us lose focus. Now granted, to be clear, speaking out loud does not let God hear us better. He hears you very clearly when you pray in your head, and that's fine. But just by way of practice, I would say, speaking out loud to God, crying out with your voice, can help protect you from distractions that might keep you from saying to God in prayer the things you want to say to Him. So He can hear you loud and clear in your head. And when you talk to Him in your head, that's great. But if you're like me, you might find that sometimes when you talk in your head, you're more easily distracted. And when you cry out with your voice, you can kind of 
pour out your heart more fluently, more fluidly as well, as you uh, make your requests and cares known before Him. I love this too. And David's prayer, you see, did not fall upon deaf ears. David wrote, And he heard me from his holy hill. He heard me. What does that tell you about your God? He's a listener. That your God listens. He hears. I, I, I just think of if I hear any one of my children cry, just how immediately my emotions are just drawn just to, just to know what's going on and just my affections in that moment are kind of rise and I'm concerned. And if I feel that way, how much more does the infinitely loving God who loves His people beyond what we can even imagine, what is it like when He hears the cries of His children? The loving concern of the Father is beyond our ability to even um, truly begin to understand how great it is. He hears us. And the more that we understand that truth, the more tightly we hold on to that, I do think it could lead to less fear and more joy. As Spurgeon wrote, we need not fear a frowning world while we rejoice in a prayer hearing God. David also said, notice, and he heard me from his holy hill. See, Absalom could evict David, at least temporarily, from the holy hill there in Jerusalem. But he couldn't evict Yahweh. I love the implications here. What's going on in David's mind? Is he thinking about the, the Ark of the Covenant, which he made sure ended up back in Jerusalem? Is he thinking of how God chose that place to be a place where he would have his name established? What is he thinking here? I don't know all the details of what's going on in David's mind, but I love the idea that there is Absalom sitting on the holy hill, but yet at the same time, the one who was truly enthroned there was Yahweh, and he heard me from his holy hill. I mean, implications, I guess, for the, the heavenly Mount Zion, but also implications for the earthly Jerusalem. Absalom could evict David, but he couldn't evict Yahweh. And soon enough, Yahweh would bring back the king, to use language from Psalm 2.6, that he had installed upon his holy hill, right back to where Absalom had evicted him from. And that brings us to verse 5, where we read the following I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. Now here, again, we saw this in verse 2. We note the emphatic I. I lay down and slept. One commentator noted how that could connote surprise. Kind of the surprise and blessedness that David felt in getting the sleep that he did. And maybe part of what's going on here. Many of you are probably familiar with the My Pillow Company. And perhaps you're familiar with the little jingle that happens at the end of their commercials. I'm going to try my best to say it without having a cadence in my voice as I recall it to you. For the best night's sleep, right, in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Yep. I did good there, kind of refrained from the cadence. Now, I, I do like My Pillow pillows. I have a My Pillow pillow. I bought one for Elder Glenn, as a matter of fact. I should get one for Elder Joe, too. If you need one, I'll get Okay. So, I, I, I'm a fan of the MyPillow products, but I, you know, if you have your son leading a rebellion against you, where your former army is being led by your son who's trying to kill you, you're going to need more than a MyPillow pillow to get a good night's sleep. You're going to need the God of heaven and earth to give you a peace that surpasses understanding. Interestingly, this was even in the Mosaic law, in the Old Covenant. This was part of the promised blessings for covenantal obedience. We see that in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 6. Interestingly, David in the following psalm would write, I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And the sentiment of Psalm 4.8, clearly there, appears to be implied here. But you see, as the verse continues, the emphasis is not on the quality of David's sleep, but on the fact that he awoke. I lay down and slept. And maybe some amazement in that. But then he says, I awoke, for Yahweh, the Lord, sustained me. It's as though David is marveling. I made it through the night. You know, if Ahithophel had his way, 
Absalom's men would have been on David like that. He's on the run. You go now. Don't let him have time to regroup. You know what your dad is like. You know that he's a man who knows how to handle himself in these situations. Don't let him regroup. Get out there. And David goes to bed. Maybe, maybe he kind of knows a good military strategy that would have been to his demise would have been them coming at him like immediately, not giving him any time to regroup. So he sleeps and he awakes and he sees God's graciousness in that. For the Lord sustained me. Now, interestingly, the tense of the verb here can speak to a specific moment that he's just looking back at that night of sleep. The Lord sustained me. Or it can also imply that he's looking back to how God continuously has sustained him. You could render it, not only the Lord sustained me, but I slept and I awoke, for Yahweh sustains me. As though to say, this isn't a one-off kind of thing. This is a pattern. This is a paradigm of how my God has so faithfully preserved my life. And he will preserve my life until it's time to take me home. Well, as a result of seeing God's loving kindness and care for David, David's courage was fueled. And in verse 6 we read, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Now we have problems in our lives. I know that. I, I know. But thanks be to God we don't have this problem. Tens of thousands of people being set around David. Get the imagery here. The imagery is that they are basically taking stances of war. It's like they're, they're positioning themselves, as Derek Kidner notes in his commentary. So it's not just that these people were saying things. They were saying things. We saw that early in the psalm. In Psalm uh, 3, verse 2, Many are they who say of me there's no help for him in God. But it wasn't just about the words they spoke. It was about the steps they took to see David killed. David here says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Now, please note, lest you be mistaken, it's not that David was never afraid. You go later on in the Psalter, in Psalm 56, verse 3, you see David say there, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. David knew what it was like to be afraid. But he also knew what to do when he was afraid. And here, the, here, the context seems to paint a picture of this, that after this night of sleep, and he actually fell asleep, and he actually awoke, and he actually was sustained, that his courage was fueled. And seeing how God preserved his life also fanned the flame of his courage at that moment. Therefore, he says, I will not be afraid. It's as though he got a burst of courage wrought by the Holy Spirit. David didn't know Romans 8.31. It wasn't written at that time. But he knew and experienced the truth of it. He lived the Spirit-inspired logic of Romans 8.31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? David had left the battle with God. And think about how this would be a kind of a, a lesson for his troops. Even as David went to sleep, it was a kind of illustration for his troops about what it looks like at times to trust in God. In that moment, it looked like David going to sleep committing things into the care of God. And you might say that it provided him with a providential opportunity to magnify God's greatness and trustworthiness, even as his men beheld him going to sleep. I think by way of application, you could think about sleep as a tangible way in which you could commit situations into the hand of God. Now, I know there are all kinds of issues that people can have with sleep, and I know there's all kinds of things that we could do to help ourselves sleep, right? You could avoid blue light after a certain time in the day, avoid having caffeine late, you can make sure the room is dark, you can make sure the room is cool, you can do all those kinds of things. But the foundation for a good night's sleep for any one of us should be trusting in God. That as we go to sleep, we know the one who neither slumbers or sleeps. Think about how instructive sleep is for us. That God in His providence has us going to sleep. That we spend like eight hours a day, or in some cases much less, in some other cases maybe more, that we spend that amount of time in sleep. And it's as though it's a reminder to us that we are frail and that God is sovereign. It also provides us with opportunities to remember that He gives His beloved sleep. So oftentimes we don't realize that it's vain to stay up late and rise up early to the degree that we could burn the candle at both ends. Yahweh gives His beloved sleep. So I say that to say, sleep is a great time to remember God's sovereignty. 
Now notice, though, David's confidence, as seen in verse 7, is coupled with fervent prayer, as we see in verse 7. So we see his uh, confidence in verse 6. We see his fervent prayer in verse 7, where we read, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Now those words at the beginning of verse 7, Arise, O Yahweh, that would sound very familiar to Jewish ears. Moses, for instance, whenever the ark would set out, Moses would pray and he would say, Rise up, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Numbers chapter 10, verse 35. The idea was Moses was very aware of the fact that if God's presence did not go with the people, they would be in big trouble. They wouldn't win battles. They would be devoured by their enemies and so on. And David knew that too. You look later on in the Psalter in Psalm 60, verse 10. David recalls what happened when the Lord did not go out with the armies of Israel. And it didn't work out so well. So here, David is looking for God to arise and fight on behalf of him and the people that were with him. His hope for deliverance was in God. Thus he prayed, save me, O oh my God. Now I love this. Think about what he said that his enemies were saying earlier. There's no help for him in God. So as David here says, save me, O oh God. It's as though he's saying, do the very thing they do not think you are going to do. Show them, Heavenly Father. Show them, my God. Show them, King of all the universe. Show them that you are with me. Now granted, it might not always look like the way we want it to look. But nonetheless, in this moment, David is crying out to God against the backdrop of those who are saying to him, there's no help for him in God. Save me. Do the very thing they're saying you won't do. And think of how instructive this is as well. You saw David's trust in verse 6, right? He, I will not be afraid. Why is he not going to be afraid? Because he's believing that God is going to give victory and deliverance. That's also further implied as we're going to see a little bit later on in this verse. But yet, that faith is coupled with fervent prayer. The two are not to be you know, opposing one another. You don't say, you know what, I'm not going to pray for God to help me because I just believe that God will help me. I get that. And sometimes that's fine. So maybe in a moment you're like, I don't have to utter a petition because I just have a quiet trust. And that's okay. But you should not box yourself in and say, if I really trust in God, I won't offer up a prayer or petition. It's not David's posture here. And he's writing as he's carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's got great trust in verse 6. But he's also got great fervency as he cries out for help and salvation and deliverance in verse 7. So you can see how both go together. The balance of prayer and faith exemplified. David's trusting did not abrogate David's praying. Then David said, For you have struck my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. And the language here in both cases is directed towards the mouth the mouth area of David's adversaries. Now, the imagery um, used here of being struck on the cheekbone could imply insult. That even as they had insulted David, that David was looking for the Lord to, as it were, insult them. You see that language used in 1 Kings 22-24, Job 16-10, Lamentations 3-30. But the imagery can also connote, and I think this is much more clearly what's happening here, though there may be an element of the former, it connotes defeat and disarmament. So when you read here, for you have struck my enemies on the cheekbone, you have broken the teeth of the ungodly, what's being connoted is this picture of disarmament and defeat. And maybe the shame that comes with that as well. David, in Psalm 58 verse 6, wrote... Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. And the idea was that if you had this lion coming at you, and all of a sudden those teeth that are going to be, you know, chomping on you are all of a sudden broken, the enemy has been disarmed and then subsequently defeated. That's the kind of language. To modern ears, people may like cringe at that, like, oh, why would he say such a thing? But the language there connotes disarmament and defeat. And you see very clearly that imagery working itself out in Psalm 58. David was essentially praying that God, breaking the enemy's teeth or the cheekbone in which the teeth are held, he was praying that God would bring to naught the weapons with which they desired to make warfare against him. 
Now, notice the language, by the way, the tense of the verbs here as it's connoted in our translation. For you have struck. You have broken the teeth. Two possibilities of what's happening here. Either David is looking back in this moment briefly to how God has delivered him so many times before. Whether it was from Saul, whether it's from Doeg the Edomite, whether it's from any number of adversaries that he has gone up against, and so on. So he might be looking back and saying, you have done this, Lord. And so he's looking for God to do it again. Or, in this moment, he may be appealing to God in such a way as to say, I just believe it's done. I just believe that you are going to defeat my enemies. And he's using the tense that he's using here to connote the, the assurance, the spirit wrought assurance, if that is the case in this moment, that the defeat of his enemies was inevitable. So you have both of those possibilities. The psalm ends with David essentially blessing God in light of two precious truths. In verse 8 we read, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. So David says here, salvation belongs to the Lord. He didn't have any confidence in himself to save himself. David's confidence for deliverance wasn't in horses and chariots. It wasn't in the mighty men that, they, that he had with him. Some of those men, when you read in 2 Samuel, they were pretty mighty. Did some amazing feats on behalf of David and on behalf of the kingdom. But his confidence wasn't in them. David knew that salvation in the temporal sense, like from any physical deliverance that comes, any physical deliverance that comes, and that salvation in the ultimate sense, spiritually, salvation belongs to the Lord. And as it relates to the former, that makes sense why he's praying to God, right? I'm going to God because salvation belongs to the Lord. At the end of the day, if we are going to win, it's going to be because God has graciously granted us the victory. That's what David is essentially saying here. But you'll notice that David wasn't only concerned about himself, he was concerned with God's people. Very interesting. In, in our text here, it reads, your blessing is upon your people. Very literally in the Hebrew, it's here, upon your people, your blessing. Upon your people, your blessing. And the implication appears to be that it's a kind of closing prayer, a kind of brief benediction where David is petitioning God. He's not just thinking about his own circumstances. He's thinking about God's people and saying, essentially, let your blessing be upon your people. Now, perhaps David in that moment is looking around him and he's thinking about all of those who weren't swayed by Absalom and there they are with him. And he's petitioning God, your blessing be upon your people. Maybe he's thinking about the nation as well in that moment. And just think how the nation was fractured by what Absalom had done. And that there were doubtless people who were still in Jerusalem who were nonetheless God's people even though they were still there. And perhaps he's hoping for God to bring about this reunification that seems impossible. But nonetheless, the idea here is rather clear. David is not only thinking of himself as he's carried along by the Holy Spirit. He is thinking of God's people. And I do think those closing words do invoke some gospel questions. And that's where we'll close. How in any sense, if you actually think about it, how in any sense could God's blessing come upon a sinful people? Right? Upon your people, your blessing. And if you know the Scriptures, and if you know the Old Testament, you're saying, how could that happen? Doesn't Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, say that cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things written in the book of the law to do them? Doesn't the Old Testament witness to the fact that we are under the curse of God, the judgment of Almighty God, the wrath of God, the wrath of God abides upon us because we have sinned against the Holy King of the universe? How then could blessing come upon a sinful people? And then if you go to Galatians chapter 3 and you see how Paul uses Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, you find the answer to that question. The blessing of God can come upon a sinful people because the curse of God fell upon God's Son upon the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. He hung upon a tree, upon that cross, to signify that He was coming under the very 
curse, the very wrath, the very judgment of God. And it's because He absorbed that curse, the wrath that we deserve. It's because of what He did, dying for our sins and then rising on the third day. It's because of Him and what He has done that the blessing of God can come upon a sinful people. Blessing in the most ultimate sense. Blessing that we would have union with the Holy Spirit in the here and now. That we would be God's children in the here and now. And that we will spend forever in His presence as reconciled sons and daughters through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me encourage you this day, if you have not come to that place, may you come today. May you come to the point where you see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is great David's greater son, the ultimate anointed of the Lord. May you see Him as the only means by which your sins could be forgiven the only means by which you could have peace with God and the only means by which the blessing of God in its most ultimate sense can come upon you. Absalom. Absalom was like the foolish rulers in Psalm 2 who raged against Yahweh's anointed. Don't make the same mistake. Yeah, raging can look like an raised up fist and cursing the Most High. It could look like that. Or it can look like a quiet indifference as the truth of God is suppressed and we keep ourselves upon the throne and we become Absalom-like. We don't want Christ on the throne, so we seek to displace Christ and we put ourselves upon the throne. So if you haven't come to the Lord Jesus Christ, learn from Absalom. His end is not a good end. You could read 2 Samuel and you read 13 through 18 and you see that his end was not a good end. But his end doesn't have to be your end. You could say, I don't belong on the throne of my life. I bow the knee to God's anointed, His eternally begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you do, you turn from your sin and self-trust and you look to the Lord Jesus Christ alone, the one who bore the curse of God on your behalf. And the forgiveness of God and the blessing of God comes upon you and never leaves you. Thanks be to God. Don't try and take the throne like Absalom did. You can't. <laughs> Bow the knee to the Son of God. Confess Him with your mouth that He is the Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. And you will be saved from the wrath of God. And in that moment, you become a son or daughter of the living God. Born again from above. Let us go to our God in prayer. Father, thank You for the way that You, in Your fatherly way, shepherd us and instruct us, Lord. Thank You for this precious psalm and thank You for all the truth within it, Lord. We pray that by Your grace You might find us making it a, a grace-wrought habit to come to You in times of tribulation and tranquility. May You work in us, Father, that we would have increasing measures of assurance knowing that You are our shield and our glory to know that you are the one who lifts up our heads, that you hear us from your holy hill in the heavenly Zion. Father, help us when we find ourselves worried and sleepless to, by your grace, sleep and to arise and to look at another day and say, God has yet sustained me. Oh, Father, help us to glory in you, the one who is our salvation. And thank you for your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. We come to you and we just pray as we go forward this day that you will help us to think upon these precious truths and that you might help us to glorify you for the blessing that has come upon us, Lord. And the forgiveness of sins, the union with the Holy Spirit. To use language from Galatians 3.14, the blessing of Abraham upon the Gentiles. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And help us, Lord, to walk in the kind of assurance that David had, even in the midst of the tribulation and adversity that he found himself in. We ask these things for your glory and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.